Right, it's uh, ten past one again, which is our the time that we uh, have chosen to do the DFO webinars. Welcome to everybody who's uh, already in the meeting, uh, particularly if it's the first time you've ever attended a webinar. I'll just uh, point out that this is an interactive medium, so we do have things like chat boxes and uh, you can put your hand up, I think, by pressing a button. So we've got all lots of good stuff, and if you've got any questions, then do type them in, and if they are uh, relate to what uh, Tracy's going to talk about or is talking about, then I'll put a, them to her at the time. If not, then we'll, we'll save them up towards the end. Tracy uh, is Stuart is a good friend of uh, Dental Fusion. We've worked together for a while now. She, at one point, held the record for the most number of people attending a webinar, which... Um, she still got the, the silver medal, so we're very pleased that she's agreed to do uh, another one for us. Um, today, she's going to be talking about the treatment coordinator role, which is practice. Uh, Tracy is a, is a practice development specialist, and she was one of the first treatment coordinators in the country. We had practice managers, of course, uh, uh, generally well known to us, but treatment coordinators have come over from the States, and I suppose at the, at the moment they're a bit of a mystery to most people. Um, we had a member ring in a couple of weeks ago because he has a treatment coordinator. He's an implantologist, and uh, the poor guy was practically in tears because she had health problems and was unable to continue in, in the coordinator role. She felt that uh, for, for a short while at least she was going to need to scale down what she could do, and um, he hadn't really thought about how he was going to cope without a treatment coordinator for all his implant patients. So... They're getting to the stage now where um, they are indispensable, and, and I'm sure Tracy's going to tell us why. So, uh, Tracy, lovely to have you back, and uh, I'm going to hand over to you now, so let's hope that that all goes well. Right, well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much uh, for choosing to share your lunch hour with me. Today's really about focusing on the treatment coordinator role and just really discussing with you what qualities a, a treatment coordinator uh, should have. I'm really focusing on the new patient consultation. There are different ways of using a treatment coordinator. For example, some will actually use the treatment coordinator at first visit for a free consultation where a lot of orthodontic practices tend to involve the treatment coordinator afterwards. So um, hopefully this will give you a good role um, and a good overview of, of, of what the role entails. For those of you that are interested, I will be running two treatment coordinator courses in Birmingham. The first is on the 21st of June and then the second will be the 12th of July and that will be focusing on implants with noble biocare. So before you decide that you're going to have a treatment coordinator, we need to make sure, first of all, that you've got the basics in place. Because practices run smoothly if we have systems. So, for example, a structured way of doing something, whether that's answering the phone, whether it's your recall system, how you present your, your dentistry. At the moment, I'm finding a lot of uh, practices are inquiring about treatment coordinator training, but they haven't really got the basics in place. So you're well off having a treatment coordinator role without the basics. So, for example, I've been spending a lot of time talking to dentists. I, I meet them for a couple of hours to find out what it is exactly that they want. And they may have worked with a consultant a couple of years ago. They might have spent tens of thousands of pounds on, on training. And they've got a great mission statement which is framed in their practice, but they can't actually tell me what it is. And so if, as a practice principal, you don't know what it is, then how does your team know what it is and where you're actually going? So in order to, to lead your team and direct your team, when you need to know, you need to be crystal clear of where your practice is heading. Because, you know, a leader takes people where they want to go, uh, but a great leader takes people where they don't necessarily want to go, but it ought to be. It's a bit like if I'm traveling to a practice and I have to go down country lanes. I don't particularly like country lanes, but if that's what SatNav says I should do, then that's what I'm going to do because it's the right thing to do and it's going to get me there. And it's, it's about also having 
a, a picture of your, your business, what does that look like to you? So today I've had a practice send over their mission statement to me, and it's about beautiful dentistry, uh, it's about a highly valued team. But what is that beautiful dentistry? Is it a full um, smile makeover, or is it just actually a front filling? Because sometimes when you communicate to your team that you want to do more private dentistry, if that picture is not clear, your team could think that you just want to actually earn lots of money. It's a bit like if I'm going to buy a house, um, and I've got a picture of a house with a nice garden and close to schools, but my partner wants to drive away with 10 cars, then we're not sharing the same picture and things are going to fall down. So we just need to make sure that we have the, sort of the basics in place, um, first, first of all. So the treatment coordinator role isn't anything that's brand new. It's been around for many years and it's been in the States for many years. I myself have been a um, treatment coordinator since the age of, of 19 and I'm a lot older nowadays. It's about concierge dentistry. It's about um, making patients feel special and having the time for them. So if you actually go to a, a hotel, it's normally the concierge that actually looks after you. It's the concierge that's got the time to give you maps and tell you where to go, whereas the reception team are really busy checking in people in and out. And that's no difference to a dental practice. Uh, your reception team haven't actually got the time normally to, to spend um, with your patients to make them feel special. And so the TCO role has been developed around this. Again, vets, you know, they tend to use a TCO role when they're actually discussing the treatment plan uh, of your animal with you. The vets, you know, then end up saving a lot of clinical time, just like dentists will. And the TCO really is bridging the gap between uh, the dentist and, and the patient. Uh, a TCO would need to have a good level of clinical knowledge. There's no point having somebody talking to patients who doesn't really understand what an implant is or what a CEREC is if uh, they don't know themselves. They need to believe in the level of dentistry that's actually been delivered in the practice, uh, so the skills of the clinician, and also the belief in the fees. There's no point talking to a patient about fees and really looking down at the floor uh, once you've presented those fees because you feel a little bit em embarrassed. The treatment coordinator needs to deliver outstanding patient care and follow your patient journey, which again should be a structured system. Treatment coordinators can be trained to actually take photos, uh, follow up all outstanding treatment plans that have not been booked with the right verbal skills so they don't feel as if they're hounding patients, how to overcome objections, present finance, booking your diary in an effective way so it's a prof profitable day rather than uh, running around like a headless chicken doing lots of checkups but maybe not actually being a profitable day. Uh, as well as morning meetings, and there are lots of structure to morning meetings. It's not a case of just reading off your schedule uh, what patients are coming in. We don't really need to have a meeting to do that. Um, next time, I will be covering the morning meeting in far detail, so, so do tune in. The new patient consultation, um, where it really starts, is that the patient loves a freebie, but with the dentist actually delivering free consultations, it becomes really quite costly, and they don't need to be the person to do this. This is where the treatment coordinators really come into a world of their own. So the, the patient coordinator would need the patient's details and really a smile questionnaire. And what they tend to do in that first meeting is really finding out what the patient wants and why they want it. Because we buy the after. If I'm actually talking to a patient about some training, they actually buy the after. If a patient's talking to you about an implant, they're buying the after. That after to them might be the fact that they can go out and have a meal in a restaurant without their denture falling out. 
um, delivering training. It may be that the practice has now got structure, it's more profitable, everybody's actually enjoying their job. So that first meeting is, is, is really using the right questions, which we'll come on to in a moment, to really find out what the patient wants, and using photos as well. Uh, the dentist can actually train uh, the treatment coordinator and other members of the team in photography, or you can send them on external courses. Uh, we run photography courses a couple of times a year. And also, those um, photos can also be used as testimonials because people love stories. One of the uh, questions that I get asked a lot from dentists, and they, can, they get quite concerned about their treatment coordinators diagnosing dentistry, this is not what the treatment coordinator's role is. It's not a case of dumping a treatment plan on the treatment coordinator and then expecting them to actually turn it into business. It is the dentist's responsibility to gain consent. The patient is at the treatment coordinator is just getting all the information from that patient, saving you clinical time and actually showing what available solutions there are in the practice. It is of course down to the dentist to actually share with the patient which of the treatments is the ideal solution for them. The treatment coordinator would really um, instruct your patient journey. So, you know, whether you're going to actually have a welcome pack, are you going to actually post that to the patient before the appointment? Uh, you can also email this. It's great to email information if you've got somebody who's maybe rung up for an inquiry but hasn't actually converted to a booking yet because, you know, if you post something, then you, you're going to have to write a letter, whereas if you actually collect an email address, which most people seem to be more comfortable giving you an email address than maybe a telephone number, then not only can you send information, but then you can actually follow it up. So your, your patient journey would be introducing yourself with a handshake, introducing yourself by name, collecting the patient's name. If you look at other companies out there, and um, you know, I purchased some perfume from Jo Malone, in December and sort of eight weeks later I had a very nice handwritten card uh, from Kirsty who works at Joe Malone to thank me. Now if I'm going to go to Joe Malone and get more perfume, it's probably Kirsty that I'm going to look for because it's Kirsty that's actually delivered that outstanding patient care. So Kirsty is, if you like, delivering the patient journey and the treatment coordinator role on behalf of Joe jo Malone. Also, maybe phoning up patients after they've had a treatment. You know, if you look at what the vets do, if, if Scooby, my dog, has an operation, when he actually gets home, it's the vet that actually gives us a courtesy call to, to see how they are. Now, a lot of dentists tell me they haven't got the time, but let's look at this practically now. A vet can do this, and a vet is actually saving a dog's life. Dentist is maybe doing a filling, uh, placing an implant, there has got to be a way that you can actually build that structure into your practice. I'm always going to give you the best way of doing things. If you go to a hospital and you have maybe a tummy tuck or you have eye surgery, if the person that actually conducted that surgery calls you up and asks how you're doing, you're going to think that that is one amazing business. So this is the difference between the clinician making the call and your treatment coordinator or receptionist making the call. It is providing that outstanding experience and this is what patients will actually be telling other patients. Unfortunately, they're not going to go to the post office and talk about the margins on that crown that you've just placed, uh, nor are they going to be talking about the, the canals that you've actually filled on your root canal treatment. It's all about how you make patients feel. So, for example, my practices have a flowchart of from the minute that the patient's actually contacted your business right through to they finish the treatment, they've had their aftercare letter call, and they're about to make a recall appointment. So, it's okay to talk about having um, a patient journey, but the team also need to have a structured way of doing this to ensure that everybody follows the same system. And that way, when you actually get new people into the practice, you're not going to actually drop the baton 
because that new person should just actually um, be given an induction and follow the system. This is the Google review um, that I came across, or one of the Google review. In fact, there were three of these. So the only thing that I've actually taken away is the practice details to obviously spare them the embarrassment. So the receptions have been rude to me. Also, I hear other disgruntled customers whilst waiting for my appointment. You do feel like you are rushed in and out without much care or interest just to give them your money. So again, what we can see here is it's not actually about the dentistry. It's actually about the experience. Uh, again, the next one, somebody else has now gone on to agree with this comment that the attitude of the receptionist sucks and they close up shop at lunch. I thought the weekends were for time off. I've possibly not met such a rude woman in my entire life. However, the actual dentists are great people, so if you can make it past reception, you'll do well. But how many people are going to make it past reception if they have such a poor experience? Now, in fairness to the reception team, you know, they may be snowed under, they could have four people at the desk, they could have phones ring in. This is where the treatment coordinator role really comes in to actually ensure that your patients have a great experience every time. You know, if you look at the Medical Defence Union, the, the kind of figures there are over 70% of the complaints that they're getting are down to the actual experience, not down to the clinical dentistry. So if you could have a role in your practice where everybody is taken great care of and they feel really special, and um, then they're going to love you forever and recommend other people. And one of the in uh, industries and uh, professionals that, that's achieving this routinely is the vet industry. I couldn't tell you how much money I end up spending at the vet, but I always feel really special. Whether it's a case of the vet actually giving me a call, whether it's sending the dog um, you know, a get well card after he's actually had some treatment, it's doing all the squishy, squashy stuff that the dentist or the receptionist hasn't got the time to do, which makes that patient feel as if they're the only patient um, in your practice. Now, the treatment coordinator, most of the time the journey will actually start with an inquiry, whether that's the telephone or whether it's email. One of the things that you need to decide is who's going to actually take that call. So it may be that you actually transfer most of your inquiries to a treatment coordinator who would normally work from an office and therefore doesn't have the distractions around them that your reception team would have. The, the telephone cannot be seen as an irritation. What I would also advise that you do is you have other members of your practice trained up to take the calls. I rang a practice the other day and was inquiring on some treatment uh, as a mystery shopper call for, for a client. And I was told that the treatment coordinator was with somebody and I would have to call back. So there's no point just training one person because how much has that lost call really actually cost you? You know, that could be a £10,000 treatment plan. When answering the phone, people can hear a smile. When I was in practice, if I couldn't hear a smile, I would actually put a mirror on the front desk so that people could actually look in the mirror and smile before picking the phone up. Obviously, you need to pick the phone up. If you're not picking the phone up within four rings, then you need to have a system to deal with that, whether it's um, a marketing uh, tool, on-hold communications, uh, provide a fantastic telephone system to do this. It also gives patients information um, on, on your services, as well as records the call for training purposes. Within 17 seconds, a patient is actually going to form an opinion of, of your practice. You know, and it's what could go wrong in 17 seconds. Is your tone a little bit abrupt because you're busy? Are you speaking too quickly? Have you put the patient on hold and they can actually hear you having a conversation with another patient? You know, there is so much that can go wrong. I mean, the basics is answering the phone and giving your name. You know, but so, so few people actually do the, the basics. I was in a practice the other day. We were carrying out mystery shopper calls. I think we did about seven. And not one person asked me what my name was. 
this is just the basics of customer service, let alone how I'd actually heard about the practice. So you could be spending £10,000 on a great piece of marketing, but you don't know whether that marketing is working or not because your team members are not actually finding out where the call came from. You know, there's no point in saying your marketing is not working if people are not booking in. If that marketing is producing a call or an email, then the marketing has worked. What's not working is the actual training within your practice to actually convert that inquiry into a booking. Now, there are two agendas here, a push agenda, where most of us have been trained on, and a pull agenda. So a push agenda is when you tell the patient all about the treatment. So whether it's implants and it might be a bone graft, whether it's um, braces and you're telling them all about the aligners. People buy solutions and they buy the after. So therefore your push agenda is not going to actually convert an inquiry into a booking. So I spend a lot of time training both dentists and team members in using the pool strategy. And that is asking the right questions to find out what the patient wants. Only by doing this can you actually then uh, present a solution to the patient. Now, in order to do this, we need to use the right questions. So, for example, an open-ended question where the patient doesn't come back with yes and or no is a great question. You know, are you happy with your smile? It's only going to lead to a yes or no. What would you like to change about your smile? What are you hoping to achieve with this treatment? That will actually generate a conversation. The great thing about this is by generating a conversation, it then becomes the patient's idea. If it's the patient's idea, it's a good idea. It's no different to me wanting a shopping trip. I always make it his idea, and off I am, credit card in hand, and I've got some shopping. So whether it's a phone call or whether it's a patient coming into the dentist for a consultation, really practice on open-ended questions. And then if we look down the list, a probing question is really good. So an open-ended question would be a what, why, when, or how. Probing question could be tell me more, anything else. So the patient's giving you some information. You don't want to actually go in and provide the solution at this stage. You want to actually explore more. So these questions, as I say, can be used in the treatment coordinator role, or if you're a dentist without a treatment coordinator at the moment, you can be using these in your surgery. Both will lead to a huge increase in case acceptance. You want to avoid leading questions. I was in a practice recently where a dentist said to a patient, you know, um, so you're aware of this in photos. Well, that's actually you leading and also pushing the patient. It needed to be an open-ended question. When are you aware of this most? The patient then may have actually been happy to share that they're aware of them in photos. Multiple questions were used oh, probably about five years ago with a lot of the American consultants. You know, what would you like to change about your mouth, your teeth and your smile? It's probably too much. And limited choice, that shouldn't really happen nowadays with the CQC regulations. And then ending uh, with a clarifying question, just to make sure that you and the patient are on the same page. Now, these questions work perfect with photos. So whether you're a treatment coordinator seeing the patient and they've put on their smile questionnaire that they wish their teeth were straighter, or you're a dentist about to do uh, a consult or an exam for a new patient and you've got the same information on the smile questionnaire, what would be good is to initially ask the patient, you know, a question. So, Tracy, thank you so much for sharing this information with me regarding uh, improving uh, the shape of your teeth. Can you tell me more about this? So now the patient's going to tell you a lot of information. Once you've got that information, before you go any further, and you absolutely do not present the solutions at this stage, you would take three photos, a front view and two side views. And again, treatment coordinators can do this, or the dentist can do that. 
give the patient a pen and ask them to actually show you exactly what it is that concerns them. When they notice it, uh, how long they've been aware of it, and if it's been a concern for this length of time, um, why they're actually choosing to do something now. With these questions, the patient will give you their entire life story. The pen is in their hand, so they're in control. Not only are they showing you um, the gaps between their teeth, they're showing you the cracks in the teeth that they've had for a number of years and the chips that they've never done anything about. They're actually showing you maybe a tooth at the back that's actually missing. So because they've got the pen in their hand, they're in control and they are actually telling you what they want. The only thing that you've got to do, both as a treatment coordinator and a dentist, is to shush, to be quiet. Because you actually leave the, the damage you could do is basically talk the patient out of dentistry. And once the patient's given you all this information, uh, the treatment coordinator would show photos of what could be done. They obviously make it very clear to the patient that they need to see the dentist for a clinical examination to see if they were suitable for this treatment. However, if it's the dentist having these conversations, then it would actually be the dentist carrying out an exam and letting patients know what the solutions are. If your treatment coordinator is having this conversation in the actual consultation room, make sure that your treatment coordinator doesn't run out of the room to give the dentist all the information and then run back to collect the patient. The best way of doing this is to escort the patient into the actual treatment room or get the dentist to come into the consultation room with the patient and hand over to the dentist everything that the patient has actually shared with you. The only question that the dentist then needs to ask is, Tracy, is there anything else that you'd like to share with me uh, on top of what Sally's already um, given me? Because then, if it's a case that they've got a, a toothache or they've got something that they feel a bit more comfortable uh, talking to the dentist about, then at this stage is when they would do that. So all these questions here, focusing on the open-ended, probing and clarifying, just to repeat, they work on the telephone, they actually work on the email, they work on a consult with a treatment coordinator, and you can even use them when your patient comes in for a dental exam. Rome wasn't built in a day, and you are coming out of your comfort zone to do things different, but it's these kind of questions that are actually really working for practices who are not actually feeling the pinch of the financial climate. It is about doing things different. Again, no different to, to emails. Uh, what I do find is practices do tend to have you know, a, a big difference with how they deal with a telephone call and an email. So if I send out mystery shopping emails, I can wait four days before I get a response. You wouldn't leave your phone ring for this length of time, so why would you leave an email not answered? So you need to actually be replying to the emails prompt. With the content, again, use questions. If anybody wants a template of an email um, reply, just send me an email to uh, Tracy, that's T-R-A-C-Y, at designerdentaltraining.co.uk, and I will happily send that to you. What you'll find is the patients will then engage with you, and you find out you know, lots of information. I, a lot of my practices will copy me into emails, so I can actually see how everything's um, being done in the practice. And also, you can follow an email up. So you can get back to that person. Uh, on the slide that you're seeing, this is a practice in uh, Doncaster, uh, a very switched on practice that's always had uh, training as, as part of their, their systems in their practice. But they actually increased their email conversions in just a couple of days by 62% by just using some of these actual templates. You don't send the templates exactly the same. You're going to have to you know, change things and make it feel more personal to the patient. But the patients don't want you know, an A4 email all about you. It should all be about the patient. When communication fails, 
Um, and this could be communication between team members, between dentist and patient, between treatment coordinator and patient, is when you communicate, you're sending a message. And you guys out there are hopefully receiving my message. But sometimes when things go wrong, it's because there are noises that get in between me sending a message and you receiving it. And I'm not talking about the dentist running around the surgery singing, we will rock you. Sometimes it can be the channel that you use. You know, I've been in practices where people have actually tried to deal with complaints via text. It was totally inappropriate and, and shouldn't have happened. So the noise in that case was the channel of communication. Body language and tone of voice. If you're asking somebody to do something and it doesn't happen, always look at yourself because it could have been the way that you're delivering the actual message. So if you're actually giving a patient a treatment plan and they don't go ahead with the treatment, could it have been your tone? Could it have been the words maybe that you use? Because sometimes the words that I use mean something to me, but they could mean something completely different to somebody else. Also timing. If you've had a cancellation, if a dentist has had a cancellation or the treatment coordinators had a cancellation, you might want to go to the front desk and talk to the receptionist about something, but they actually may be snowed down with work at that particular stage. So in order for communication to work well, it's actually got to be using the right timing for both parties. So just to clarify on that, if a patient doesn't book the treatment plan, if a team member doesn't do what you'd ask them to do, before coming to the conclusion that they're lazy or um, anything negative, always come back to yourself and just ask yourself, did you actually deliver that message in the right way? Listening skills are so important for a treatment coordinator, receptionist and dentist. Sometimes what happens is we judge people and when we judge people, we place labels on them. And if you place a label on somebody, then you're not listening to, to what they're telling you, which again could lead in that, into that patient not accepting the treatment plan. Filtering uh, listening skills, uh, otherwise known as man-type listening. I was in a practice recently where I watched this. A treatment coordinator was sharing with the dentist in front of the patient everything that she'd collected. However, the dentist was actually listening, uh, sorry, the dentist was actually reading off of the card. And unfortunately, whilst he was reading, he wasn't actually listening to what the treatment coordinator was sharing with him, which then led into him asking a question that the treatment coordinator had already given him the answer for. And it didn't look great to the patient. You know, rehearsing, when we're talking about listening, sometimes when you're reading off a script, if you're actually focused on looking at the next question and not listening to the patient, that can cause some problems. And the best advice I could give you there is if a patient shares anything with you, just have one question in your head, which is why? And then daydreaming, daydreaming is where you guys might be on Facebook, you might be on Twitter, you might down, be down the pub for lunchtime, but you're not really listening to anything that's taking place in this presentation. Hopefully you're not, so we will carry on. I'm not going to go into too much detail on the DIS personality, purely because we haven't got the time. Um, but a great book on this is The Four-Dimensional Manager by Julie Straw, because each different personality type will actually make a decision in a different way. So, for example, a dominant uh, personality just wants to know what you can do, when you're going to do it, and how much is it going to cost. Your C-type personality is going to want to know every single bit of detail, so it's unlikely that they're actually going to actually make a decision today. So you want to make sure that you actually communicate with that personality in the right way, especially if you are the same personality type. Uh, as I say, uh, the Four Dimensional Manager book will give you some great um, information on the personality types as well as the personality tests that everybody in the practice can do. And it also explains how you actually uh, are a little bit different. 
The SMILE profile, most practices have actually got a SMILE profile and normally the treatment coordinator would have this with uh, patient's details and a medical history in their actual initial consultation. It may have things on it like I wish my teeth were white, I wish my teeth were straighter, I wish the gaps between my teeth were smaller. It's an opportunity for you to actually provide your patient with dentistry. It may be a case that a patient has come in and they've got the metal showing on their crown. But they don't know what can be done, so they don't mention it to you. The dentist would love to do something about it, but doesn't think the patient's interested in it. So the SMILE profile will actually find out that there's an opportunity there for you to be able to do um, more, more dentistry. But again, you need to take photos and you need to actually ask questions. So your photos here could be used with the patient with questions and a pointer as a pen, so they show you what's going on. How many of us see these patients here with the metal uh, showing on their crowns? It could also be used as an after, as a testimonial, and share Maggie's story here, maybe with Jenny who's come in. So just to show you a couple of photos and how great the photos can work. Just a little bit for the dentist now. Um, once the patients actually come in and they're having their exam, I sit in with a lot of dentists and I watch them with their recalls and what I'm finding is the value is not actually being delivered. So it might be your upper left seven has got an occlusal, the BPE is 212, pop your tongue to the left, the right and your breathe of your mouth. With the way I work with people in practice, not only does the patient get this little report card to take away with them to show the value, the nurses will actually attach a question to each of the areas that you can see on this actual card. So the nurses might say things like, how much harmful plaque and tartar does Tracy have? And then there will be verbal skills that the dentist would use to actually lead to a much higher case acceptance, which we will go into for more detail next time. So the dentist needs to agree first of all that there's a problem with the patient, preview that there's a benefit of actually doing something about it. You then actually will select, select the possible solutions, whether it's a brace, whether it's a bridge, whatever it may be. Outline how it works, gaining consent. You need to preempt the objections and then reinforce the benefits of doing something. But most dentists miss this final part, which is closing and also treatment coordinators. Uh, if you take the C off, you've got lose. So once the dentist has actually presented all the information to the actual patients, you need to actually just ask one question. How would you like to proceed? Because if you don't, you just send the patient out to reception and you're just assuming that they're booking the appointment. And when they don't, you get really upset that you've spent all this time an effort and um, you've got a no. The finance presentation is just a business development tool. Your patients will actually pay for weddings, mortgages, cars on finance. So why can a patient not actually have um, a dental implant for £90 a month or straight teeth for £40 a month? So just think about giving patients choices of how to pay for the treatment just in the way as you give them treatment choices of clinical options. Again, the treatment coordinator would make sure that they've got effective tracking systems, so they would know how many inquiries they've got each month, how many have booked, how many people have actually had an examination, how many people have booked, how many recalls were sent, and how many people have booked, and would have structured ways in following all of this up to ensure that your patients go ahead, and if they don't, you know exactly why, so you can improve on this. The final couple of systems that the treatment coordinator uh, would really be grateful is introducing your payment plan and securing the patient as a loyal person in the practice. Different ways on, on how to present that. Also managing the diary uh, causes a lot of stress in practices where you're just actually booking lots of maybe checkups or you've got gaps in your diary actually having clinics booked and using the verbal skills such as 
Um, Dr. Jones reserves special time in his diary for this type of treatment and the choices you have available are A or B. If the patient doesn't take those, you offer them another two. But by being in control of your actual diary, you really reduce the stress. Again, when I actually do the next session, we will go into a lot more detail of how you can actually manage the diary in the different ways. But today, I just wanted to really let you know that it is part of the TCO role. Also, recalls, you know, setting reminders and online bookings now. You know, if you send out um, an email for an online booking on a Thursday, patients could actually be booking these appointments on a Sunday when you're closed, which really reduces the calls to your practice on a Monday. And you can send this actually in a format of a text or an email. But also, don't send out the recalls and just assume that people are going to book. You need to actually tra track who has and who hasn't and do something about the ones that, that haven't. And finally, the morning meeting. You know, it's worth its weight in gold. If you walk down the high street on a Thursday, you'll see the banks that they don't open until 9.30. So it's focusing on your targets and goals. It's focusing on are there any patients that haven't had hygiene? Are there any patients that um, own money? Are there patients that need photos? Are there patients that need a smile questionnaire? It's about having a planned, structured meeting that will take about 15 minutes to ensure that you have a really smooth running day. Well, hopefully I've not overloaded you. I've tried to give you as much information within the time that we've, we've got. Uh, and if there's any questions, I'm happy to actually take those now. Thanks, Tracy. That, that's amazing. That 40 minutes has absolutely flown by. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, I think it's true that patients always notice things, although they don't always mention everything. So, for example, if there's a light bulb blown in the, in the surgery, uh, you can think, well, nobody's mentioned it, and so they probably don't, you know, they haven't seen it. But they all have seen it. They just won't have mentioned it. And uh, I know, I know, sort of light bulbs is not technically your your area, although it is something, of course, that you would be concerned about. But um, my, I, I think the gist of, of what I got from what you've just said is that people need to be trained in this; that they don't automatically know it. You know, it's everything that's involved in running a dental surgery is um, it, people can be trained in it. And there's a ton of stuff. I mean, I've been amazed at what you've covered. And every one of your slides probably is, is a subject in itself that you could have talked about for at least 10 minutes. Um, and uh, just, I, I think, just going, if anyone who's listening to this just goes back and says, okay, to the receptionist, I've, I've just watched a webinar, and basically the gist of it is you've got a smile on the phone, then I think they will have missed the point. Um, because uh, there, there are so many um, ways to get this wrong, aren't there? And, and probably only a few ways to get it right. I know when you get used to doing it, you build on your successes and eventually you get, you get to the point where the whole thing's working very smoothly and everybody knows their job and, um, and you start to see the sales taking off and it, you know, dentistry becomes a pleasure. But um, we've had a couple of questions. One of them is um, about training in a recession really because during a recession everybody tends to want to try and cut back on expenditure and see what they can can not pay for so how do you justify training at a time when the you know sales are going down well i think first of all you've got to look at it on the other way um when we actually have a financial climate like this how can you afford not to train your team because if a patient is calling up and they're asking the cost of something and your team member's just given the cost, well, you've just lost that at, at opportunity. Um, you know, you might have spent some money on marketing. In fact, I'm finding a lot of practices are spending the money on marketing, but they're not spending the money on training. And they're both going hand in hand. So you've generated the call, but the team have not been trained how to actually handle it. And so it's actually cost you money and you've lost the patient. What we tend to do to try and help practices is we do run workshops. So it's not as in-depth as me going into a practice. And obviously, in a practice, I'd be working with everybody. 
uh, opposed to one person. But by having a, a com for somebody coming along to a workshop, you know, you're only looking at an investment of a couple of hundred pounds. And if you can't afford to send a team member on a course for a couple of hundred pounds, then you really are in serious trouble. Uh, what we also do is we do run half day um, sessions in the practice, which have been really popular because it means that the practice doesn't have to close for a full day. Plus, you've had the training, and at two o'clock, you get the chance to actually try it out on your patients. Lovely. So it gives you a competitive advantage, and, um, and and as I know from my own personal experience, it leverages whatever you spend really on training and marketing. Is, that that should be leveraging your income. So, you know, you should be getting back two, three, four, even eight or ten times what you're spending on these sort of activities, because they directly translate into sales, and uh, and then you say sales conversions. And once you you learn the magic of how and let's face it, we all know when we, we see it ourselves, when we're sold to ourselves, we love it. I mean, I love being treated the right way in a shop. Uh, and uh, it's a shame that we can't automatically reverse that. And uh, But uh, when you get it right, then you have a lot of very, very happy customers for whom cost is really not, not a consideration. We're talking of consideration, it's about two or three minutes to two. So out of consideration to those of you who have got to get back to work, we're going to find the... Uh, webinar up now. Thank you very much, Tracy. Thank you very much to everyone who attended. If you want to uh, keep track of when these webinars are coming up, you can follow us at dentalfusion.org or uh, go to the website dentalfusion.org uh, forward slash events uh, because they're all listed there. So until next time, um, thanks very much. <laughs>